Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Lai San. Uh, very honored to welcome uh, our guest, Hannah Katerin, um, who is the uh, assistant curator at the Freilin Museum of Art at the University of uh, Virginia. They are gonna give a presentation of Wilkie's work called Performalist Self-Portrait uh, and the critical reception uh, uh, the work received uh, when she made them uh, in the 70s. Um, so let me introduce Hannah to you. Uh, Hannah Katerin holds a master's degree in art history and theory from the University of Essex in Colchester, England. Uh, their curatorial interests include contemporary art and uh, the enhanced visibility of historically excluded them, LGBTQ plus and BIPOC uh, artists. Before joining the curatorial uh, department at the Freeling, they served as the curatorial assistant at the University at Buffalo Art Galleries. Previously, they were collections manager and assistant to the estate at Tony Conrad Archives in Buffalo, New York, a documentation assistant at Essex Collection of Art from Latin America in Colchester, England, and registrar at the Castellani Art Museum, Niagara City <laughs> in Lewiston, New York. Well, just uh, at least uh, okay. share your, your screen. Thank now. you. Thank you. Yeah. I I want to thank you, Laysan, for inviting me. Um, it's always great to talk about Hannah Wilkie's work. Um, I am coming to you now from the traditional homelands and territories of the Monacan Nation in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, all right. So Hannah Wilkie was born in New York City in 1940, and as a, as a child showed an early interest in photography and art making. Um, she was a prolific artist and worked in several different mediums, which you can see on display at the you know, had a Wilkie friendship on display the gallery right now. Um, she worked in, you know, sculpture, performance, video, photography, painting, and drawing. Her work utilized both abstraction, realism, and documentary methods to visualize the femme experience and explore themes of sexuality, eroticism, and feminism, among many others. Um, I always think it's important to note that while Wil Wilkie's investigation of femme subjectivity and these these um, different subjects was greatly influenced by her um, her privilege as a white thin middle class person, so I just like to like, keep that in mind. Wilkie coined the term performalist self portrait to describe photographic work she created and directed others to photograph. And it was in 1970, after her mother's mastectomy, that Wilkie really began performing and having herself photographed nude. The introduction of Wilkie's body into her work prompted an extensive valuation of her physical appearance that would appear in reviews of her art for the entirety of her career. The exhibition of Wilkie's first work featuring her body took place at Ronald Feldman Gallery in New York in 1974. This work, titled Gestures, which you see four stills of here on the slide, it is a 35 minute single channel video featuring a single shot of Wilkie's head and neck. Throughout the work, Wilkie uses her fingers and hands to manipulate her face, sculpting her cheeks, nose, forehead, and lips as if she would a mound of clay. Uh, Wilkie's inclusion of her face and gestures provoked several critics to spend an inordinate amount of time assessing the merits of her physical features while failing to engage with her work in any critical way. In their art forum review of the exhibition, James Collins found gestures to be the most, quote, successful, end quote. And I put that in quotes because I'm not sure what his metric for measuring success is. Um, he put that, you know, he, he, he found gestures to be the most successful work in the exhibition explicitly because Wilkie included her own body in it. Um, Collins throughout the review commented on Wilkie's unquestionable good look while interpreting gestures as a work exploring Wilkie's narcissistic infatuation with herself. And we'll see that narcissism, this claim of narcissism will play out throughout a lot of Wilkie's self-portraiture. Um, so keep that, that theme in mind as we're talking about this. Um, Collins went out to write, quote, Wilkie's position in the art world is a strange paradox between her own physical beauty and, the very serious, and her very serious art, end quote. The formation of this limiting binary mode of engaging with Wilkie, wherein her thin, white, cisgender, normatively attractive body somehow refutes the significance of her work, would impede engagement with her artistic practice for all of her life. This binary, while first articulated by Collins, would go on to be adopted and reinforced by several other art critics and feminist scholars, including Lucy Lippard. So Collins really does set up this like kind of mode that of a prevailing mode of thinking about Wilkie's work 
that positions it that she's too attractive to make anything that's really serious. So that 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 will be echoed throughout um, criticisms of her work. Following the exhibition of gestures in November of 1974, Wilkie performed Hanna Wilkie Super Tea Art for an event titled Soup and Tart at the Kitchen, a nonprofit artist organization in New York. For the performance, Wilkie stood on a pedestal in high heels with a large white tablecloth draped around her, enacting a series of poses while transforming the cloth from a toga-like robe into what essentially kind of resembles a loincloth or a diaper. <laughs> Wilkie described the work as a crucifixion, the different poses representing a transformation from Mary Magdalene to Christ. And while this work was dealing with, um, you know, the religious aspects of it, it's also Wilkie's way of addressing the kind of crucifixion she feels where her physical appearance is hypersexualized and discredits, discredits her artistic practice. Um, so following the performance at the kitchen, Hannah Wilkie Super Tea Art was restaged and photographed under Wilkie's direction, which is what you see on this slide here. And the previous slide was a detail of these images. The resulting images illustrate the various poses Wilkie performed as she evolved from modestly robed to exposed, utilizing the white cloth to emphasize her progression from pose to pose. Hannah Wilkie Super Tea Art is Wilkie's first use, use of a repetitive, overwhelming and seemingly endless series of self-portraits. And while this work was concerned with aspects of the sculptural, and we see that illustrated in her use of the drapery, um, she's using a contrapposto pose in some images that kind of um, make us think of Greek Hellenistic sculpture. Um, so she was definitely thinking about aspects of the sculptural. What's even more telling about it is her engagement with language. It really reveals Wilkie's exploration of feminist subjectivity. Wilkie's work often played with language, redefining and weaving words into different meanings. And we see that in the titles of a lot of her performance self-portraits. Wilkie claims, I did super tea art as a pun for soup and tart, or super tart, tart being a whore or something, or a primal prostitute of art, end quote. Here, the primal prostitute of art is slowly crucified through Wilkie's exploration of femme subjectivity and her lived experience as a femme artist. So we see how she's kind of illustrating that for us through um, through Hannah Wilkie's super tea art. And then she's giving us these clues through language where she's playing with puns and things like that. Mm. Developing from her sculptural work, Wilkie started forming small sculptures out of gray kneaded eraser in 1972. She included these sculptures in several mixed media works, placing the forms over postcards or places from around the United States and compiling them in patterns on white painted pieces of wood. Like her ceramics work, the forms were repeated and accessed. And she found when the anonymous gray of the eraser no longer worked for her, she turned to chewing gum. In 1974, she began placing the sculptures on her body in a series of performance and photograph work titled SOS, Star Station Object Series, which you see illustrated here. The performances, the performances Wilkie presented, one held at Gerard Pilzer Gallery in, Febu in Paris in February of 1974, consisted of Wilkie handing out sticks of gum to audience members as they entered the gallery. Wilkie would then take her place at the center of the gallery um, she would collect everyone's gum, and after stripping, she would model each piece into the, the small sculptural form, and she would place it all over her naked body. Mm. One iteration of the series, completed in 1975, which is shown here, consisted of 28 performalist self-portraits arranged in a grid pattern. Throughout the photos, Wilkie performs a vast array of poses, utilizing different props with small sculptures placed on her fingernails, forehead, cheeks, chin, breast, and back. So we really see her in this work kind of running a gamut of, of performed femme subjectivity, essentially. Um, here's a detail of those. Throughout the images, she's both averting her gaze from and addressing the viewer. Um, she's enacting and at times exaggerating different femininities through each pose. In some, she's active and engaging flirtatious and seductive, and in others, she's more reserved and passive, shy and modest. Um, the images really embody the spectrum of performed femme sexuality and subjectivity, 
while addressing also labors of some beautification processes, which we see illustrated with um, different accessories like the curlers or things like that. Um, thinking about the labor that some individuals put in to their beauty processes, essentially. Characteristic of her work will be played with language in the title of SOS, Scarification Object Series, with scarification being a play on scarification. In replacing scar with star, Wilkie was examining the scarring effects of femininity and beauty using SOS to symbolize an urgent call for rescue from these damaging effects. The SOS series provoked some of the most severe criticism any of Wilkie's work received. Through these, criticisms, through these criticisms, the art world's bizarre preoccupation with Wilkie's beauty is most evident. Um, in a review published in Arts Magazine in September of 1975, Mark Savat found Wilkie's ability to perform the image of a sex kitten without having to deny her own beauty, the most impactful aspect of the work. In another review for Art Forum published in December of 1975, Anne Sargent Wooster wrote, quote, Hannah Wilkie unfortunately felt she had to get on the bandwagon of artists' nudie pinups with a vulgarly accessorized, i.e. unzipped blue jeans, hair curlers, etc." rendering of her semi-nude flesh, end quote. Um, Sargent was quick to note the work's resemblance to other male body artists of the time, such as Robert Morris, Vito Acconci, and Dennis Oppenheim, but found that Wilkie's use of her own nude body enacted in what Sargent deemed, quote, peep show hoopla, end quote, undermined the critical questions posed by the work. Um, so again, we see how male body artists of the time are afforded this um, liberation in using their body in their art and it's not criticized in the same way um, that the physical appearance of a lot of you know femme or female um, body artists of the time and of all the critical writings on Wilkie's practice hands down the most influential and well-known were by American writer and art critic Lucy Lippard um, in her essay titled The Pains and Pleasures of Rebirth that was first published in Art in America in May of 1976 um, through the through the essay, Lippard set out to explore the issues raised by body art and its relation to feminism, excuse me, arguing that the accusation of narcissism, often associated with women's body art at the time, reflected attitudes towards femme bodies as consumable objects. So here we have Lippard challenging previous, you know, previous criticisms of body art by women as narcissistic, which we also saw criticized in um, gestures and other works by Wilkie. Narcissism is something that keeps coming up. So here we have Lippard like starting to explore this narcissism. You know, she wrote, quote, it's taken for granted that any woman who presents her new body in public is doing so because she thinks she is beautiful, end quote. But the disconnect here is with, with um, the person who gets omitted from this discussion of the accusation of narcissism for Lippard is Wilkie. Um, and the discussion of narcissism and beauty for, for Lippard ends with a critical reading of Wilkie's practice. Um, and Lippard states, quote, Hannah Wilkie, a glamour girl in her own room, is considered a little too good to be true. She flaunts her body and parody of the role she actually plays in real life. Her own confusion of roles as beautiful woman and artist, as flirt and feminist, has resulted in politically ambiguous manifestations. So again, I think it's interesting here that we have Lippard kind of reinforcing the original binary that Collins kind of put Wilkie in as well. Um, and I also think it's interesting here, the way she sets this up that you can either be a beautiful woman or an artist. <laughs> you can either be a flirt or a feminist. And those things can't exist. They, there can't be a duality in that. Those things can't exist together. Um, and for Lippard, Wilkie's use of you know, sexuality or flirtatiousness or even her own beauty makes all of the political things that she is trying to say in her work too ambiguous. So rather than challenging the prevailing binary mode, here we see, you know, Lippard enforcing it. And what she's doing is she's failing to question. Rather than questioning the systems that trap Wilkie in this binary, um, she dismisses Wilkie's work. So the SOS series really was a manifestation of this dichotomy. I read it as this visualization of that. You know, it was used by Wilkie to explore her own ideas of femme subjectivity, her own ideas of beauty. And although many critics of the SOS series focus on Wilkie's use of eroticism 
um, critiques of narcissism, what they often did at the time was they failed to acknowledge the complexity of the work. Um, it's examination of roles some individuals are meant to play, that they're stereotypically, um, you know, meant to play, and it's comment on the marking of feminine, as uh, the marking of the feminine, the feminine, excuse me, as damaged or wounded. So again, she's using these, um, these gum sculptures as kind of, you know, this scarification metaphor is that there is some scarring that's evolved, that is involved in performing the feminine, because you can never win. You're either, you know, not attractive enough, or you're, too attractive and too sexualized to be taken seriously. So in 1978, Wilkie created another set of performalist self-portraits titled So Help Me Hannah. The photographs were taken at an abandoned school building in Long Island City, um, where Wilkie roamed the halls, bathrooms, basement, classrooms, and rooftop of the building, wearing nothing but high heels and carrying a toy gun. For their initial exhibition titled Snapshots and Ray Guns in 1978, the 48 photographs were installed above a collection of toy guns and accompanied by 100 postcards with typed quotes from male writers, artists, philosophers, and critics. Um, there's quotes from Edmund Burke, James Joyce, and Karl Marx, among others. Um, and these quotes really explore the relationship among individuals, art, and society. Um, the photographs that were on display show Wilkie in, posing in various locations around the abandoned school. So here, for this example, she's um, laying on the floor in, I believe, the basement of the school. Um, the piece liter, um, later became a series of video taped performances where Wilkie was filmed roaming around the school and she would pause for moments in these different poses. And that was accompanied by a soundtrack in which she read longer extensions of the quotes from the original display. Um, this is another iteration of the So Help Me Hannah series. So in 1984, six of the images from So Help Me Hannah were enlarged and then captioned with shorter versions of the postcard quotes for a group exhibition titled Art and Ideology at the New Museum in New York. Um, in one image of the series shown here, we see Wilkie gracefully balancing on top of a large compressor in the basement of the school, and below her, Karl Marx's exchange values is printed on the compressor. Um, in another, Wilkie sits on the corner, um, in the corner of a classroom, her elbows resting on her bent knees and her legs spread open, surrounded by toy guns and Mickey Mouse figurines. And a quote from Ad Reinhardt um, is printed at the bottom of the image, which reads, what does this represent? What do you represent? Um, and so throughout Wilkie's So Help Me San Hannah series, what she's doing is she's really like visualizing the battle that she faces within prescriptive feminism. Um, a work that was made a few years before this that used one of the SOS images um, was titled, you know, Marxism and Art, Beware of Fascist Feminism. And Wilkie really was reacting to a lot of the criticisms of her work and the mandate that feminist work should look a certain way. So her roaming around this school, she's really visualizing, for me, she's really visualizing her battle with this binary that she's confined in. You know, the binary of beautiful woman and serious artist. And she's really, in this image in particular, you know, art historian Amelia Jones talks about how she's both cornered physically in the room by the gaze, but she's also subverting in that she's not, you know, her body language is very casual. She's not addressing the viewer. She's surrounded by toy guns, which are also a symbol of, um, you know, she's got quotes from male intellectuals. You know, she's, she's pulling us into this quote what does this represent? What do you represent? Asking us um, to really think about that. And throughout her career, what she was really doing was visually exploring the effects the evaluations of her physical appearance had on the acceptance of her work. It was a central theme in her practice. Um, she acknowledged how the political aspects of her work were ignored by critics in favor of comments on her body. And in, in a statement from a 1985 interview, Wilkie said, quote, people give me this bullshit of what, it, what would you have done if you weren't so gorgeous? What difference does it make? I was still alluding to the suffering of humanity. Gorgeous people die as do the stereotypical ugly. Everybody dies. Um, Wilkie's comment on the reality of death would prove to foreshadow the diagnosis of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma she re received in June of 1987. As Wilkie's cancer progressed, she underwent a failed bone marrow transplant in May of 1992, 
and in January of 1993 traveled to Houston, Texas in search of alternative treatment. On January 28, 1993, Hannah Wilkie died from lymphoma at the age of 52. Wilkie's final performalist self-portrait series titled Intravenous, which we see um, here, was exhibited posthumously at Ronald Feldman Gallery in New York in 1994. 13 72 inch by 48 inch color photographs were displayed amongst watercolors, sculptural objects, and an installation of video work. The works were made during the final years of Wilkie's cancer treatment with the assistance of her partner, Donald Goddard. Several of the large color photographs were presented in diptychs and triptychs displaying a powerful group of performalist self-portraits. In intravenous one, Wilkie is sitting erect in her hospital bed, her bald head covered in a large white shower cap resembling a halo. She stares straight at the camera, meeting the viewer's gaze head on, her face slightly, slightly swollen from treatment. In the accompanying image, Wilkie stands against a white wall, nude save for two, nude save for two large white bandages affixed to each hip, balancing a large vase of flowers on her head. In a triptych subtitled Marilyn Monroe, Wilkie is shown laying nude atop a white comforter with the same white bandages affixed to her hips. The images show Wilkie shot from above, enacting some of the same poses used in her earlier performalist self-portraits, echoing images from the So Help Me Hannah series. Wilkie's body is swollen, her hair is tangled and greasy, and throughout the three images, she stares out at the viewer with a look of simple engagement on her face. And this is a detail of one of the um, intravenous uh, Marilyn Monroe, subtitled Marilyn Monroe works. And I think we really can see just the echo of her previous work and how she's continuing this enacted performalism, this performance, performalism, you know, her self portraits. She's really enacting this kind of performed um, femme subjectivity. None of that has changed. What's, what's only changed is Hannah's physical appearance. The images from another triptych titled Intravenous Number Three show Wilkie in the final stages of her illness. Wilkie sits in a portable toilet in a hospital room wearing only slippers with an IV inserted in her chest. Her bald head is lowered and her gaze is fixed on the floor. In the following image, Wilkie's laying on her back in a white bathtub, her head under the running water and hands resting on her stomach. Her legs spread open to the camera. The last image, in the series is, is powerful in its relation to Wilkie's performalist self-portrait project. Wilkie stands nude in front of a white wall, her usual heels replaced by white slippers. She turns her head slightly to the right and raises her chin, staring out at the viewer. Her body is hairless, slightly bruised and aged from cancer treatment, but she is still performing for the camera, enacting a femininity that echoes earlier images from Hannah Wilkie's Super T art and SOX, SOS work. While this image and many others like it in the intravenous series show an obvious change in Wilkie's physical appearance, it doesn't demonstrate a change in her artistic practice or approach. Again, the Performalist Self-Portrait series produced a drastic change in the reception of Wilkie's work, initiating oftentimes retroactive praise from critics who dismissed her earlier work. This retroactive approval is immediately evident in one of the first reviews of the posthumous edition of intravenous. Elizabeth Hess, her review of the exhibition published in the Village Voice in January 1994 with, quote, Hannah Wilkie slipped through the cracks in the last decade of her life, making art in an unappreciative world. She will not be overlooked in death, end quote. Hess's view drastically contrasts with another review of uh, Hannah Wilkie's exhibition that she did that Hess wrote just five years earlier, where Hess, you know, noted, quote, Wilkie was flaunting her naked self and has led her to be more, known more for her beautiful body than her art, end quote. But following the exhibition of Intravenous, Wilkie's performalist self-portraits self were then deemed, quote, courageous works of art by Hess. While critics, praised, while critics praised Intravenous as an extension of Wilkie's previous work, they focused only on Wilkie's use of her nude body to make that connection. Critics refused to see the deeper, deeper questions Wilkie addressed and always attended to, and always in, and oh, excuse me, and always intended to address. Although all of her, throughout all of her performalist self-portraits and the seamlessness with which intravenous fit into Wilkie's over was reduced to the use of her nudity. So what we see in a lot of these posthumous 
you know, write-ups about the exhibition is the only the connections that a lot of the critics are making is, oh, she's still nude, you know, she's still using her nude body. Um, they're not tying that into the performalist aspects of her earlier work. And the narrative structure of Willie's performal, Wilkie's performalist self-portraits has was well established before the exhibition of Intravenous. Um, and Wilkie began to investigate the implications of bringing her body into her work with the creation of Super H Hannah Wilkie's Super Key Art. And she warned of the harmful effects of limiting binary modes in SOS. You know, she called for help. And when her warnings were not taken seriously, she performed and subsequently lost the battle with that binary and so help me Hannah. Um, acknowledging the negative reception and disparaging of Wilkie's performalist self-portrait project was really central to Wilkie's practice. Um, she was really commenting on that throughout all of her performalist self-portraits. And failing to examine these criticisms, the criticisms that these works face, face really weakens readings of works, particularly works like SOS and So Help Me Hannah. As critics are just solely focusing on Wilkie's loaded, you know, cancer-ridden body and examinations of intravenous photos, it's just as reductive as, you know, earlier criticisms of her work and kind of has a lot of roots in ableism as well. What's happening here is Wilkie's commentary on femme subjectivity is still as much a central part of understanding her earlier work as it is in reading Intravenous. Um, in 2008, um, Donald Goddard disclosed Wilkie's intended name for the exhibition of the Intravenous works was Cured. Um, and for me, what that title reveals is, again, Wilkie playing plain on words, right? Um, we have the hope for the resolution of her illness, but also playful commentary on her art critic's perception of her work. So for me, you know, cured refers as much to being released from preoccupations of her physical appearance. So now she's saying, well, you can't talk about how beautiful I am, you know, and, and as much as it does in hopes for her being, you know, cured from her illness. Um, the intravenous images had a powerful effect on the art world's perception of Wilkie and generated praise and respect for the artist from some of the very same critics who rejected her earlier work. Wilkie's presentation of herself in the intravenous series removed all accusations of exploitation and narcissism from its reception. Again, so we see Wilkie using her body in what normatively would be deemed an unattract, like using her, you know, cancer-ridden body, which would be deemed normatively unattractive and she's using that um her use of that in intravenous somehow retroactively um removes all accusations that she was exploiting herself or that she was using narcissism from from this reception but her practice hasn't changed so the response to her work changes right but her project remains the same um, up until the end of her life, she's utilizing her body in her performalist self-portraits, no matter what state it's in. The posthumous celebration of the Intravenous series does not retroactively revalue Wilkie's previous work, but rather it instead, it reinforces the principles her work was always concerned with. Um, but again, I, I think it's important to remember that Wilkie's some subjectivity was um, influenced by her white as gender thin privilege. Um, the root of, for me, really the root of Wilkie's practice was based in the, the desire to communicate visually through her own unique language, communicate the femme experience and her responses to it. Um, and that way she used the body, specifically her own nude body, as an instrument and object for the creation of visual expression. The aesthetic pro progression of her performalist self-portraits reflected Wilkie's response to the influence her femme body played in the reception of her artistic practice. It also reflected Wilkie's desire to fuse her physical body, which was continuously objectified through the art world's preoccupation with her beauty and her inner self, in an attempt to kind of really destroy that binary that she found herself trapped in. Um, Wilkie's art is powerful and it's challenging and it raises difficult questions about beauty and the femme experience. Um, and again, for me, the importance of Wilkie's work lies in its engagement and response to the limited criticisms her performalist self-portraits received before her death. Her work really prompts viewers to examine and challenge narrow and prescriptive representations of feminism, femininity, and the femme experience. That's it. <laughs> thank you, Hannah. That no, was thank very you. 
that was very powerful. Thank you so much. So um, we would like to ask you a few questions. Sure. I was, um, while you were pre presenting, I was just noticed uh, some differences between the earlier works uh, when she first did the in the 70s, you know, the photographs, mm -hmm. uh, the um, uh, Super T art and- Super T art, yeah. Yeah, and then the, 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 the performers uh, self-portraits with the chewing gum, they were all done like the images were all smaller. But then when she did the intravenous, they were really big. So 74, yeah. this 47 by 70, Yes. I'm yeah. I'm just thinking about the, the image. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, when you look at installation photos from the Ronald Feldman gallery, I mean, I wasn't there, right? I was, I was too young <laughs> to go there, but um, I could just imagine like walking into that space and being met with this blown up image, you know, this like Wilkie's body is occupying all of that space, yeah. truly. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it is such a departure from kind of the smaller black and white photographs. But I think that was in the power of that, the power of that intravenous work. I mean, it was really such a, you know, it was displayed posthumously. Um, so it was almost like, I mean, I, this is my reading of it. It's like Wilkie wanting to take up more space and be there when she couldn't actually be there, right? Because she had, you know, she had passed away. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, that's a, that's a great observation. And I haven't seen many of the intravenous works in person, but I can't imagine just the power of how, you know, the scale yeah. really. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I just, uh, I just realized that when you, in, you know, when you presented the, 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 um, the chronology of the whole, uh, her career in that series. Okay. Yeah. So just wondering about, wow, that's impactful. And mm -hmm. especially when um, her intravenous photos were, really not flattering she was flattering. Yeah. yeah staring at her image images when she's not a uh, attractive playboy <laughs> right right like, so it's so yeah different. yeah yeah and that's i think that's such a that's such a great point right because for me it's that the practice was never about her vanity right that mm -hmm. that that was never about her narcissism it mm -hmm. was really about her you know her visualization of these experiences, like performing, you know, because in intravenous, there's still instances where she's doing a pose, right? She's, she, you know, you still, you see the flirt, you know, the flirt, the, the, flirt, the, yeah. the narcissist, the narcissism that, right. that, that the, uh, the, yeah. Yeah, you still see her enacting those poses. Uh -huh. So, so much of the power in it for me is that she never gave up on that practice, right? She never gave up on that series. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's just a departure from that in the contemporary criticism of that work when it came out. Mm, so. That's right. Yeah. So um, would you like to uh, talk about the metaphor? You know, I think um, how uh, you, you say throughout the presentation about her use of language and words, you know, the puns yeah. and all that, you know. Yeah. Uh, so um, the metaphor for chewing gum, perhaps, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Great. That. Yeah. Yeah, so again, the brilliant way that she played with language, um, and we can see, you know, tongue in cheek and kind of punny, you know, things that present throughout her work. But again, Wilkie, again, was so prolific, but everything had meaning for her, right? her work truly related to her life. So using, you know, chewing gum as a metaphor for literally giving it to visitors in a gallery and having them chew it up and spit it out right again like how you know femme people and women in society through patriarchy and white supremacy are just used and chewed up and then, and then spat out when they're no longer when they're no longer useful or beautiful or you know oh, serving oh. Purpose, right? yeah. yeah serving their purpose right yeah, yeah. so right, in, yeah. in I love how she, she you know she's doing that and super t art you know super tart and then mm -hmm. sos you know i love that like it's starification object series but it's also sos like a ship isn't you know a ship is in distress i need mm -hmm. help mm -hmm. um you know and even tongue in cheek with so help me hannah so it's so help me hannah but also also oh, help me hannah you're dry you know like mm -hmm. you're you know like mm -hmm. something you your goal. mother would yeah. say yeah something your mother would say to you like oh so help me hannah so <laughs> yeah her use of her use of language is really powerful too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we, uh, I have a final question for you. Um, then we can just wrap up, I know. Um, 
this is a, it's a bit of a, a, to me, it's kind of a serious question. Um, looking at her work and looking at the context now with the trans movement, mm -hmm. because she, you said in your presentation, she's a cis uh, woman. She is. Using, yeah. yeah, she's using her body. Um, she biologically uh, born with the, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the women's parts mm -hmm. um, and and to make art. Uh, uh, so how you um, would then she would she be excluding the transgender so that body? That's a, yeah, that's a that's a really great question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, okay, good. So her a lot of her so she started sculptural work you know, in, in the late 60s, um, working in ceramics. And these genital forms that she made, which, you know, there's examples of in your gallery and, and mm -hmm. we're familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, she often talks about how they, they can resemble both female genitalia and both male genitalia. She, I don't think, she often gets put into an essentializing idea that like, that's why I like to think about her work through femme subjectivity, really, because it's really about the feminine and the feminine can be can be performed by anyone. Right. Like femininity is not tied oh. to your genitalia. Right. It's not it's not tied yeah. to it's tied to mm -hmm. your your gender pre presentation, your performance, your how you view yourself in the world. Um, I mean, I don't mean to say that there absolutely could be um, moments where she was unknowingly transphobic or again feminism at that time was very exclusionary of trans and non-binary and lesbians mm -hmm. and other individuals mm -hmm. um second wave feminism had that kind of identity crisis and there mm -hmm. still are feminists today who you know are very transphobic and exclusionary mm -hmm. um but i think for me there's a lot of room in wilkie's work to not think of it in a very um biological kind of way but think about it as the ways in which femininity is not restricted just to people with a certain type of genitalia essentially okay. right like yeah. femininity uh -huh. femininity is explored by lots of people of all different gender expressions and things like that so um and again I, I think for me too when I first encountered her work and especially the early sculptural work and it's just these these repeat repeated forms right these genital forms mm. that often get read as vaginal they get read as you know um you know, as biologically female, but then I was reading more about Hannah talking about it, and, and for her, it really was, there was this ambiguity to it, you know, like some people said that parts of it represented, you know, what, you know, biologically male, you know, genitalia and things like that, so mm. I just, I think it's, I think it's important for us in this context to widen our ideas about femininity and who gets to perform it or think about mm -hmm. it or, or things okay. like that, so. Okay, so then, uh, uh, why don't you close with your your assessment of uh, or compare com co comparison to Cassils? Yeah, yeah. Um, so Cassils, you know, a really brilliant, brilliant contemporary contemporary performance artist works in photography and and video too. The the great connection for me with them um, and Wilkie is that Cassils really sees their body as a form of social sculpture, right? Their body appears in so much of their work. It's a central facet of a lot mm -hmm. of their work. Mm -hmm. And they really see their, their body as this site for social sculpture. And I think that a lot of that was what Wilkie was doing too. Like body's body, Wilkie's body mm -hmm. was this central aspect um, of her work in a lot of ways. And also, you know, Cassils' earlier work references, you know, um, Linda Banglis, like Cassils has a piece titled, you know, Homage to Banglis. So mm -hmm. I think Cassils was definitely thinking about, you know, body art of the 60s and 70s. And I imagine they're familiar, they're familiar with Wilkie's work. But for me, the, the connection truly is in them using their body as a site. Mm -hmm. Their body is the site for the, the political and the social mm -hmm. and the, mm -hmm. their body is an essential piece of their art. You know, I, I love how Cassil's phrase is that their, bo their body is a site for social sculpture. Like my body is a sculptural piece, you know, mm -hmm. that is that is commenting on these, all these social aspects, which is, you know, a huge, a huge thing for anyone who is coming, anyone who inhabits a body that has been historically excluded or marginalized, right? Mm. You're, you're, you inhabit this body, you walk through the world in this way where historically, 
you've been marginalized. So we have that, you know, the femininity with Wilkie and we have, you know, the queerness with Hassel's and things like that. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Absolutely, well, great. Um, all right, so uh, I think uh, we've, um, we can wrap up. Uh, you know, we appreciate you coming uh, on you. The Zoom and give this amazing presentation. Uh, I think we have a much deeper understanding of Hannah Wilkie. Exhibitions like yours and just get her getting more exposure and, and talked about more, I think. Um, yes. Her work has a lot to offer. And through you, because... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think you, 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 you do have a future plan to uh, <laughs> probably write a book or something about... Uh, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. We, yeah, we look hopefully. forward to that. Yeah, to that. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, Thank you so much, Hannah. And uh, so uh, we'll say goodbye to you. And um, okay. and uh, all, right. all right. Thank so, you so much. Yeah. Thank you.